morning, everybody. Of course, uh, World Cup recently completed, immediately after St. Lucia's leg. I was invited over to Guyana to view the semi-final and then over to Barbados for the finals of Cricket World Cup. That was cut short uh, because of, uh, well, my vacation was cut short because of the impending weather system that I uh, had to come back to St. Lucia to attend to. So far, we've done a full assessment, well, 90% full assessment of our facilities on island. They all seem to have been spared the actual disastrous potential of this system. And so I feel very confident that uh, the investments we've made so far have been protected. Um, in addition to that, the constituency of Grosley, we definitely had some challenges along our water shore on Bay Street. And uh, we will attribute all of that to the fact that we, the climate change and the rising seawater levels. Um, but generally, I've been able to tour most of the constituency, and we are very close to being back on track, except for damages to our jetty, our recreational facility, and some, and some property. Questions? Any damage to the new, the new bills? Playing center, which I am, I know the one by the beach because they had some concern. And but the grocery recreation facility yes. was there any of this? Yes, enough? we had some damages along again the the, the waterfront. Um, we did build a wall. I shared concerns on um, additional fortification for that facility um, with the, the the designers, the contractor, and the Ministry of Tourism. And uh, we did not open the facility, although many persons were wondering why, because we were um, seeking some additional funds to ensure that this um, wall was given additional attention. Um, but generally, when you're dealing with a Category 4 hurricane, um, we know that sometimes, no matter what is done, you may have some damages. And uh, we are now, along with the mayor's office, who did a tour with me along the Grosley waterfront, um, considering additional wave breakers along Bay Street um, into the marina area, um, popularly known as the Joe Blow, Enda and Crew area along that sea there. Um, and so we are just patiently awaiting the disbursements of different financing for us to continue our cleanup in that area. Um, what about the, any of these on the sporting the facilities in the around? Any updates on the 14, for sporting facilities in around St. Lucia? Because I know they had some, as a lot of the waves and things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, one of the first things I did the day after was to have a conversation with the um, permanent secretary in the Ministry of Sport, who activated most of our uh, our sports officers, the director of sports, to do a full analysis of our facilities. Um, generally, we were spared. Mindo Philip Park was spared. Darren uh, Sami Stadium was spared grossly. Um, the, the fields, ex except for, of course, some of the challenges we have with um, the playing field in Labry Crossover, which is right next to the water, would have experienced some damages. And the indoor facility has been a concern, considering it's significantly under um, sea level. And so we had some flooding issues at the indoor facility that we are dealing with. Um, one of the ways we are going to be dealing with the indoor facility and the, the constant flooding when it rains is as we continue to work on the aquatic center, ensure that a proper drain is built that will ensure that there is a better flow of water away from the indoor facility. And we're certainly expecting that those works will continue and uh, uh, add this to part of their mandate. Okay, I have a question for Mr. Quinn Sergis from Choice. He's asking how's the um, eSports World Cup going mm -hmm. and um, uh, how does St. Lucia intend to revamp well, eSports here locally? Well, the World Cup, I can say for St. Lucia, went very, very well. Um, and as an objective measure, like I said earlier, I was, in, I was actually invited to Guyana and I had a look at the facility and what was done. Um, and of course, we are friendly rivalries in terms of development and sports generally. I can say that safely that St. Lucia has 
far exceeded the expectations of many other people in the region. Um, I was also able to attend the final in Barbados and look at what they did. Of course, they spent almost triple the amount of money that we did, considering they were hosting the final. And I can say that St. Lucia is on par. St. Lucia is on par with the rest of the region. And I believe that our legacy is the fact that St. Lucia has announced itself as one of the premier venues to host cricket in the entire world, not just in the region, but in the entire world. Um, I think what really accentuates that is the work of Kent Crafton and his crew in terms of pitch preparation. Um, we hear so much about the pitch being one of the best in the world. And what we've done is the work we've done in terms of the, the, the locker rooms, in terms of the media center, in terms of you know, the playing facilities, the toilet facilities have really brought St. Lucia up there. And the lighting system that we've also put in, a modern lighting system that could provide entertainment as well um, for fans when they come to cricket, I think we, uh, we have something to be proud of. I think all of St. Lucia is proud. I, I think even the opposition in the heart of hearts, they are proud of what St. Lucia is. Any St. Lucian who genuinely loves St. Lucia would be extremely proud of what we've accomplished um, as it pertains to cricket development and as it pertains to St. Lucia hosting the World Cup and the reputation that we've now developed. And so moving forward, we have as a government decided to invest heavily in the, as a result of the success of the World Cup and as a legacy project, the St. Lucia Premier League T20 cricket competition. We will be over the next two years um, investing significantly into player compensation, into sponsorship for this event to really continue having that level of of, of fandom in the sport of cricket and talent identification. And so I'm very, very buoyed by what we've done and what we'll continue to do. We have to look forward to the CPL um, this year, uh, another event where St. Lucia gets to showcase its beauty as a nation. And um, of course, persons continue to speak about our fans being the rowdiest in the region. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Anybody who comes to Daranzami and things get hot, here the national would they enjoy cricket in St. Lucia more than, uh, more than most places they travel to. And so I feel very, very confident that moving forward, that the facility will continue to be that, that development thrust and that proud moment for us in St. Lucia. Um, CPL this year is going to be exciting. It's going to be the last year Guyana will be hosting the final. And so we'll see what happens in the near future as it pertains to CPL. Um, actually, I was, actually, I was asking about eSports World mm -hmm. Cup. I don't know if you know, but mm -hmm. there's an ongoing World Cup, I imagine. And um, how do you intend to revamp that sector? Well, yeah. we've invested in, and that, that is the beauty of making investments that sometimes people don't understand. We invested in ensuring that we had a replay screen that could rival any replay screen in the world and having a scoreboard that could rival any scoreboard in the world. And it's there, and it's placed at the Darren Sammy Cricket Grounds. Now this doubles up as a venue for hosting esports competitions. And we are certainly hoping when we have our alternative sports season that all the media will come out to see our esports competition played on a large replay screen, a large screen, uh, which really lends itself to persons being more and more motivated to be part of the billion dollar industry that is esports in the world. And so um, we are buoyed by that and we'll certainly be looking forward to seeing what sort of regional competitions, international competitions we then can attract right here in St. Lucia through alternative sports, specifically through eSports. So that is the vision that we've had from very, very early on. Um, we also will be, and I guess that gives me a, a good opportunity to announce, we will be using those two screens again uh, as the premier viewing area along, along with that stands area for the final of the 100 meter um, event and of course the 400 meter Olympic event and so we are planning the ministry is planning the watch parties right there big screen on the venue at Darren Sami we also planning to have uh, a concert like experience for people to actually come and enjoy the hard work that Julian Alfred and Michael Joseph has put in to get to the Olympics so there's a lot of utility from the investment that we've made in the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds and other grounds around St. Lucia. Is work still going on at the, the cricket grounds though? Certainly work, work will continue um, beyond. And we always said that we are going to continue. It's not just about the World Cup. It's about providing St. Lucian athletes, cricketers, footballers, 
and uh, anybody involved in athletics the opportunity to, to develop. And so one of the things that we are going to continue to work on, we have the equipment on island right now in terms of gym equipment. Um, so we have state-of-the-art gym equipment and we will be um, constructing the area for strength training for our athletes at the Darren Sami and the Mindo Philip Park. And so this will also help with the further development of our athletes as they compete with the world's best. Um, yes, sir. now that um, the works have been, you know, up upgraded at the Darren Sami, mm -hmm. we know um, from the sports um, events we're getting into the entertainment mm -hmm. season. I mm -hmm. know this is a controversial topic that you know you've crossed the lines with, but in terms of maintenance, I, like how you say that. <laughs> <laughs> because I think everybody in Solution knows by, by position. Yes. But in that. terms of the maintenance aspect, because you know, as well as yes. building it, the maintaining it, also, yes. will there be any, like, say, um, regulations or, 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 or factors put in place so that these promoters or whatever adhere to? Keeping you know the grounds in in in, in, a, in the upkeep of the grounds. Yes, we put together a comprehensive usage facility usage sort of policy or guideline for our facilities. Um, my concern, and it will always continue to be my concern, is the discipline of our people. I've always been. Uh, of the position that it should be discontinued in terms of the utility for all these other events because of the lack of discipline and the fact that the ministry will have to foot the bill thereafter and then this affects the athlete in terms of they being able to use the facility. This has always been my concern as a sports minister. I continue to share those concerns because we have a country where a lot of the times we put in everything in place and the individuals that are supposed to um, follow those guidelines do not. And that has always been a concern. Um, but that being said, one of the proposals I'll be making to cabinet is the establishment of a national entertainment center that will definitely allow for those big mass crowd events um, to be put together. I have a proposal as the sports minister who said very early that he would not like to see additional events other than sports. And I will continue to double and triple and quadruple down on that position as a Minister of Sport. I do not know another Minister of Sport who has a different perspective. Um, and definitely identify that area. So after this season, by next season, we can definitely have an alternative to have our entertainment and fun as a nation. OK, and just, you said um, to complement the, 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 the SPFL, mm -hmm. the cricket, you know, um, league will be on. Will, be, will that be within a year's time? Is there a time span that you know you have to, to implement this for the T Twenty cricket competition. Yes. yes, we are. We have been in conversation with the organizers of the of the SPL. So there's SPFL, which is the Saint Lucia Premier League football competition, Saint Lucia Premier Football League, and then there's the SPL, which is the Saint Lucia Premier League, it's a cricket competition. And the, the planning has been um, in full effect for October this year. Of course, those timelines can be shifted based on what happens. We are in a very very tumultuous time as it pertains to weather patterns. Um, <laughs> we saw the perhaps the rainiest December and January, and then we saw a very dry February, March, April. So I think um, we are looking at the timeline of October to have the competition around the island. We're certainly hoping that Grosley Playing Field will be one of the venues ready by then. Of course, the Mindo Philip, the Mindo Philip Park, uh, Darren Sammy Cricket Grounds, and Philip Master Grounds down south. Um, so we are working feverishly to ensure that we have the biggest T20 local cricket competition we have to date and we as a government is going to definitely make the necessary investment to ensure that it's exciting cricket um, continues in our island. Uh, the Olympics are coming up. Um, what are your thoughts on Julian Alfred? I understand she's preparing um, anxiously for for the Olympics, mm -hmm. what what would you say to her and to say the solutions at large? Well, I think anybody who is a track and field purist or sprint specialist will say, without a doubt, Julian Alfred is the fastest woman in the world over 60 meters. Nobody could beat Julian Alfred over 60 meters in the world currently. Nobody. I mean, she would have to have a, a miserable day at the office for that to happen. Obviously, the coach will identify the final food as the area of concern. Um, in terms of when she gets there, maintaining her top end speed um, and ensuring that she can brace the line first. I think over the next two, three weeks, um, that would be the main area of, of focus and emphasis for her. I think once that is done, um, I think she will have a very good showing at the Olympics. Um, we've never had a sprinter um, at that level 
you know, so close to the Olympics in terms of being amongst the top three expected to medal. Um, and so I'm certainly hoping that she does very well. Um, not many questions are being filled about Michael Joseph, but I'm also, as a Jacques Rosalie, looking forward to the 400 meters uh, for Michael Joseph. He is one of the athletes that have come through lips and bounds, um, working very, very hard to shock the world. And uh, I don't. I think most people out of Grosley will be shocked, but not people in Grosley because they know of his potential. And we're certainly expecting him to put in a very good show, make it to the final, and do the unexpected for the people of St. Lucia. And I know he's very motivated because of the amount of attention that other athletes are receiving that he is not. And I know he's working extremely hard along with his coaches and, of course, his family. Um, so I certainly wish him the best as well. Good morning. I just wanted to present a preliminary assessment report of Hurricane Beryl for the St. Lucia Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Forestry Sector. As you know, on the 1st of July, Hurricane Beryl impacted St. Lucia, and the ag agricultural sector, as we know, has always been very vulnerable to natural disasters especially caused by wind. And obviously, anytime we have <clears throat> wind damages, the first that comes to mind is the banana and planting subsectors. We begin, began an assessment on the 2nd of July, where we commence from the south and ended in Roseau, looking at the damages caused by the wind in terms of the banana and plantain sector, subsectors. What we observed is that in the southern part of St. Lucia, the damage was a lot less compared with areas like the valleys, like Mabio Valley, <coughs> Roseau Valley, including Bexon. <coughs> Sorry. We also suffered major losses in the fisheries sector, particularly in the Sufre area, where preliminary reports indicate that 26 fishing vessels reported damages. We also saw a 70 to 80 percent damage to the CMOS subsector, and we all know the importance of CMOS and where CMOS is grown, and the whole behavior of the Atlantic Ocean during the storm would have obviously impacted the sector. In terms of the livestock sector, some of our poultry, our <clears throat> soil farmers suffered, suffered minor losses, some in terms of damage to the infrastructure, some farmers suffered loss of some of the, the layer birds, the chicks, etc. But that subsector was not that bad compared with the whole banana and planting subsector. So we have so far presented a preliminary assessment in terms of value of damages for the various subsectors. And so far in the fisheries sector, as I said, it's preliminary. We are looking at damages, damages costing $698,000. In the livestock sector, $120,000 non-banana crops, and that includes areas like the, the vegetable, vegetable farmers the, or the vegetable subsector, and we are estimating 617,000 loss in terms of damage. The banana sector that got the major blow is somewhere in the region of 3.4 million, you see, and the planting sector, 2.2 million. So overall, our preliminary summary in terms of value of damages to the agricultural sector stands at 7.079 million EC dollars. And to go further in the agricultural sector, the damages were very severe in regions three, and that is the Mabio Valley, and in areas like regions five and six, which is Miku and Sufre, for other agricultural crops like plantain. So, we are so far looking at a total damage value of about $7 million in the agricultural sector. 
which represents about 34%. Last year, in June, when we had Tropical Storm Brett, we had 75% damage to the agricultural sector. But this time it's a lot less. But the impact is still very heavy on especially our banana farmers. And I will say that because our farmers have been going through this challenge every time around this year. And just recently, you would um, remember that we provided some almost one million EC dollars to our farmers for loss of boxes. We provided some assistance after Hurricane Tropical Storm wet last year. We made available 44,000 bags of fertilizer free of charge to our farmers. And every time our farmers are getting set to get this income, to take care of themselves and their families, we are faced with those challenges that we have no control of. And I just want to take the opportunity to mention that the ministry is already engaging three insurance companies to see how we can come up with a mechanism to assist our farmers. The owners cannot always be on the government to get the resources because we know that resources in government is always very limited. But at the end of the day, we know our farmers are very resilient, our farmers are very determined because they understand the importance of our food security to the country and they are playing that role in a very positive way. I want to <clears throat> appeal to our farmers that we will do the best we can to assess the situation and to see what level of support that can be provided. Our fishers, just imagine going down there yesterday and I actually saw where some of the boats were located. I don't know how those boats were fitted between buildings. And at the end of the day, the first thing that comes to mind is what will happen to those fishers who lost their engines, lost their, their boats, the boats are damaged, but yet they have to survive, they have to take care of themselves, they have to feed their family. So it's a really um, bad situation for them. And this is what climate change, as we say, you know, can have that negative impact on livelihoods, especially the vulnerability of the agricultural sector. So I just wanted to present these preliminary findings. We are going to, I'm going to make a presentation to the cabinet in a short while. And so we will make a determination as to how to move forward in terms of dealing with the damages in the agricultural sector. In terms of, I know that the government had made strides to make, to grow more climate resilient, I guess, um, fruits. Um, some of them non-traditional to St. Lucia. Um, where are those programs currently? Can you give us any updates on those programs? And, and what, I guess, is the time frame for them to become actually viable as, not maybe for export, but at least for our local um, market to participate from? Well, this question reminds me of the, the existence of the Taiwanese government. I'm sure you recall that they have introduced a number of tree crops that are foreign to us. Mm -hmm. And I remember some of the, the mangoes, the Atkinson and all those other mangoes that have been used by our farmers, one to stabilize riverbanks and to also construct more organized or stable windbreaks. I know farmers that we visited earlier this week and their plantations were intact simply because they were established windbreaks in close proximity to those plantations. And this is what a lot of our farmers have to understand. We have to try to build the resilience that is required in the sector. I know some farmers, it will be very difficult for them because of their location, maybe on the steep slopes, on the mountains, and so on. But what we want to do is to encourage farmers to do that. So the, your, the answer to what you're saying is that that is in the making, and we are continuing to ensure our farmers remain focused in terms of building that level of resilience using those various tree crops that were introduced to assist them in doing that. I, I also know that, well, we spoke about, and the Prime Minister kind of touched on it a little bit, about the, the possibility of the crop insurance. Now, I know that that can be a tricky thing to um, work. How probable would you say that that, that could be come to the, the fore? 
Um, I don't know how <laughs> close in the future, but how probable will you say that? We Remember, come? we had a um, wind crop. And at the time, it was to protect our farmers and to help our farmers during the reign of the banana industry. And that insurance company, what it, it, it did was to take responsibility for compensating farmers during events like this. But unfortunately, that crop insurance came to an end and some of our farmers suffered. But you recall during that time, St. Lucia, St. Vince, and Dominica, and Grenada were all involved in banana production. That's why we call it Wind Crop. It was a Windward Islands insurance company. And it did not continue. I wish it was there. But currently, our situation requires that our farmers need that level of protection. If we push in the agenda of food security and we want to ensure that we have, um, we have food availability, and sustainability, we must give the, the, the farmers the assurance that we are providing us the support that is necessary. I got calls from some farmers asking whether we should, they should cut the trees because they seem to be of the view that an assessment has to be done by the various officers in an effort to receive some level of compensation. Now, obviously, if a farmer has two acres of bananas, and 34 or 45% of that is destroyed. Obviously, the income will be a lot less than is. So the insurance will provide some coverage to the farmers and not be solely or heavily dependent on the government to find the resources to assist. And I'm not in any way saying that I have an issue with government compensating, but I believe it is time for us to establish some level of insurance that would take care of our farmers in situations like this. Now we have what we call the cost insurance that is supposed to take care of the fisheries subsector. But there is what you call a value that has to be reached. Now I can't remember what it is. So I'm hoping that with the situation in Sufre, that that value will reach, be reached and that those fishers will get some level of compensation. But we must ensure that we try our best to help the fishers, the farmers, because their income would be, would be, would be um, in problems. And at the end of the day, we may find ourselves going back to where we were a few months ago. This banana industry is very, very important for St. Lucia. We have a market in the region. And every time we find ourselves in situations like this, it's like a setback, a drawback for our farmers, especially meeting the demands of the market meeting the quality standards required in spite of the level of assistance that the government has provided and will continue to provide our farmers and fishers. Um, yes, sir. in terms of the, um, the, banana, the farmers and the insurance po policy, the initiative was like um, there should be a collaboration. It mm -hmm. would bring a better cost factor. Very would good. the OECS in any way be able to assist in that in that um, in that in, in that endeavor. Well, actually, is there a, a machinery or something? Well, that actually, we we have this CARICOM group of ministers of agriculture, and insurance is is one of the items high on the agenda. So far, I know Saint Lucia, as PM mentioned, has allocated six hundred thousand dollars for Saint Lucia. Guyana is very much interested in terms of insurance, crop insurance and also I'm hearing Antigua. But we were expecting countries like St. Vincent, Grenada, Dominica, St. Kitts and Nevis, because we've always been discussing that topic when we meet as ministers of agriculture in the region. So we are hoping that if all those countries come together, it will make matters a lot easier for us because the premiums will be a lot lower. Because what we find in recent years, and obviously the insurance companies seem to be a little a little unsure as to really give coverage to the agricultural sector because of the vulnerability and the number of persons involved and the impact it can have. But I'm hoping soon from now we will be able to get all the countries in, in the region to come together and offer a package that is regional rather than local or national. Um, Minister, I think you, you, uh, you addressed the question I'm going to ask, but I want you to be clearer on your response. Um, I know that there are many fishers out there, their boats were um, damaged, 
and some of them, the C2 game away. Specifically, can you speak directly to, is there assistance um, that's gonna be made for those fishers or monies have to be gathered to assist such, because you rightly said that a lot of them, what they do for their livelihood is fishing, but right now that their boats have been damaged, um, how assistance gonna be given to them? Very good, and remember in, in, in Sufre, in February of this year, there was this storm surge that caused damage to a few boats as well. So that's a situation that's happening in less than six months, twice. I have gotten a few calls. I don't want to mention of persons indicating interest in wanting to assist the fishers. And I think priority should be given to those persons who got their boats damaged. I actually saw in Sufre yesterday where the boats are actually there, but the engine is missing, that all disappeared. Now, obviously you can't find someone just going to a store tomorrow to say, I need a new engine or I need a new boat. So we must provide some level of assistance to ensure that we can get the boats repaired and we can get the engines repaired if they need repair to really assist them in doing that. But we are hoping that the good government that I'm part of will find some way of assisting the fishers. But it's too early to say that another decision has to be made by the Prime Minister. Am I clear? Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to uh, say today that I'm very pleased to see that all of you are here. You survive the storm. And it's good that, to see that you all are smiling. I'm here this morning basically to give a sort of status report on where we are as a country in as far as the impact of tropical storm burial had on the country. I must indicate that we have no major infrastructure damage. No major infrastructure damage. Uh, much of our response was about clearing of roads, fallen trees, uh, unblocking of culverts and drains, really minor, minor incidents of interruption. In one or two cases, we were called upon to at least um, clear up some of the waterways, ravines, etc. But generally, we seem to have survived quite nicely. And I do hope that Mother Nature spares us in the months ahead as we continue to endure the hurricane season. I must take this opportunity to thank the staff of the Department of Infrastructure, the Chief Engineer, Mrs. Um, Renata Fulgen McKee, who has led the department now for over a year and who more or less guided the department as we prepared for the hurricane season. Ahead of burial, we undertook a number of initiatives. One is, or was rather, the pre-hurricane program, which is a preparatory program, preparing the department for the hurricane season. And that normally starts with the review of our operating um, procedures, our emergency operating procedures to make sure that all is in place in terms of readiness. Readiness of staff, readiness of infrastructure, readiness of equipment. And that was done. It also entailed the clearing of what I call minor infrastructure um, waterways, mainly uh, um, gutters, waterways, you name it, drainage, wherever those may be, uh, we were engaged in doing that throughout the country. Those sometimes are not visibly, or visible to the extent that people can see major works have been done. But throughout the country, that was done to clear some of those um, waterways. Uh, our desilting program was, in, was undergoing at the time to ensure that the major ravines, the major rivers are desilted. And let me just explain this matter of desilting, which I have attempted to explain even in Parliament. Desilting is really to ensure that flood-prone areas are cleared of debris in the waterway, meaning that the base of the river where silt normally is retained, that those areas are cleared. It is not intended to denude the river of its natural environment, which would enable and or, or, or modulate hydraulics in the river. So that program continues even as we speak in this first month of the hurricane season. The department also, again in terms of preparation, 
for the second time, instituted what it's, it called its community cleanup program. So the Friday, actually the Friday before the, the hurricane, which was last Friday the 27th thereabout, or 28th, the department was engaged in its, its sort of community services activity. And throughout the country, I'm sure you may have seen them uh, doing work, whether it's just debushing, cleaning up drains, etc. That, that exercise was being done by the staff of the department, not as overtime, not as additional work, but as their contribution to the country. The chief engineer, deputy chief, engineers, engineering assistants, and of course, um, other staff of the department were all involved. I showed my face in the union area to give support and lend support to the staff in that exercise. On the day immediately after the hurricane, they were out in full numbers doing their reconnaissance and assessments to determine what measure of support and intervention that would be required. And as we, as we speak, they are currently engaged in the compilation of the list of responses and to see and to continue to do the assessments. Okay? We know that we are in the hurricane season and we also know that this is supposed to be the year for infrastructure. Now, we know that climate has a, a real negative effect often on our roads in particular. Mm -hmm. Are we build, building climate resilient roads? And if we are, what are we doing specifically to ensure that? Of course, that's part of <clears throat> the year of infrastructure. And the year infrastructure is really the, the commencement of what we call infrastructure 2030. And what infrastructure 2030 is, is really a strategic plan for infrastructure. And that will be not just about building roads, because sometimes we launch road programs, you know, at one time, and I'm sure many times you have heard of RIMP 1, RIMP 2, RIMP 3, RIMP 4. Now we also have a RIMP 5. And what, RIM, what those RIMP programs are, it's really road improvement and maintenance program. The problem with these programs is that they're, they're, they're intermittent programs. So you come in and you spend $50 million and you do a rehabilitation of certain roads while other roads are deteriorating. So we are saying that, listen, let us begin to look at some things. Let us develop a strategic plan. Let us look at climate change. Let, let, let us look at um, climate resilience, um, you know, and all of these sort of things to ensure that our roads have that kind of resilience to be able to withstand any kind of weather. So in the strategic plan, we're looking at policies and we're looking at operational procedures. We're looking at um, matters of guidance, design of roads, etc. And that beyond will then begin to be the standard for road construction in St. Lucia. So, for example, one issue we have, and it's while we speak of climate change, but we also have what we must say it is human change in terms of how do we operate, how do we behave. You normally have the Department of Infrastructure going out and rehabilitating roads. What happens soon after rehabilitation, one of our friendly utilities would come and dig up the road. And then we've, as soon as it is dug up, then you see the deterioration of that road. We are now in the process of rehabilitating Chelsea Road. But before we do that, if the only way we can have our water lines is to place them beneath the road, then we must change the lines. So in the city, what we are doing is to put in new water lines for the, the new water lines to ensure that when we construct the road, that there's no interference, maybe for another 10, 15 years, which is the lifespan of those roads being constructed. But your question is an excellent question. It is one that the department is beginning to sensitize and we're hoping that we'll get international support. In fact, most likely, a team might be participating in the International Road Federation Conference, which will be held in Puerto Rico next month, hopefully. And if all goes well, that is a, a relationship where engineers and road builders and persons involved in, in structural engineering would meet and to discuss new technologies and the manner in which to construct proper roads. 
All right. I, I'm actually happy that you kind of touched on Wasco. My, my next question will be related to them. Mm -hmm. um, we know that during Hurricane Thomas, we had serious silt issues at the dam. Mm -hmm. um, I've still not been able to get any clear answer from whether opposition or government as to what is being done to... Because I know the dam still cannot um, hold the, the necessary amount of water. So mm -hmm. what is being done to deal with that silt issue? Yeah. In fact, recently I met with Wasco on the heels of the dry season and the problems which the country seemed to have been experiencing at the time in terms of supply of water. And whereas I'm of the firm view that notwithstanding the, the reduction in water storage during the dry season, I am of the view that Wasco can manage its resources much better. But more than that, the problem we have is the our inability to improve our water storage capacity on the island. We have a tremendous amount, we should have rather, a tremendous amount of capacity at the John Compton Dam. But the John Compton Dam has been silted for many years, reducing the capacity to probably 10%. The last administration undertook to desilt the dam but was able to achieve less than 10% in, in that exercise, which cost the government $60 million. So going forward, in terms of, and I always use the term infrastructure 2030, and that is because in, infrastructure 2030 is a forward-looking plan, not a plan to continue doing the same thing over and over again and saying, we are doing, we are doing, we're building roads, we're building roads, but if you're building roads and then you've got to come and fix soon after, then you're doing nothing. If you continue to experience every dry season shortages in water and you're doing nothing to improve capacity, you're doing nothing in terms of producing more water. And that's what the WASCO is supposed to be. So in our strategic plan, I have requested WASCO to themselves develop a strategic plan for water infrastructure. And that is one, renewing the water infrastructure throughout the country whether it is the dam in terms of the silting, and I personally believe, again, that we need to look at new technology rather than to wait when the dam is silted, but to have continuous desilting, to be able to get the equipment stationed at the dam, to be able to desilt at the given times when it is best to desilt. So you don't wait to develop a project. And the problem with projects is that you need a consultancy. The consultancy takes, ten, um, takes a whole year. Then after you've gotten the consultancy, then you must apply for the loan to the CDB. You know, we have been waiting on the completion of a consultancy almost for a year now to improve the wa raw water line from Millet to Cicero. On that line, it's most of our problems because those lines are all deteriorated, they're leaking, and so we do not have that ability to transmit from the dam the capacity and the volume of water that is required to the treatment plant to be able to supply the north adequately. So we have to begin that change of looking at things differently. We cannot, and I've indicated to Wasco, there must be a vision plan. That vision plan must be a plan that will entail not just preparing WASCO and its infrastructure and its distribution, etc., for this today, but preparing WASCO for the future development of the country. Where is the future development of the country? The future development of the country is the potential of a northeast village between Grosile and Denry, with a highway that may attract either tourism development, residential development, or otherwise. If you just think of that, development taking place, the development of that side of the country, that corridor of the country, then it means that we need to increase our water production by over a million gallons of water a day. Now, do we have what it takes? We depend on surface water, water from the rivers. We don't have any aquifers and rivers, at, um, wells from which we draw water. Wasco now needs to begin thinking about investing in water generation desalination plants, and otherwise. So it is that, that is part of what I am looking at, 
And the ministry is looking at in its overall strategic plan to begin to say, let's not continue doing the same thing. Let's look at new initiatives, new ideas that will be able to meet the expectation and the demand, the demand most of all, because sometimes we have expectation, but there are demands where, you know, we need to be able to satisfy. Um, yes, sir. Um, <coughs> yes. We know of the um, critical role that bridges play in mm -hmm. terms of the transport network. And lately, you know, government has undertaken some some works in that in that aspect. Yeah. What what can you the, can you give us an update on the stability of these bridges? I know some are some are ongoing, some have yeah. to be rehabilitated. What would be the, the you know the stability of our bridge good. network? In good, very good question too. The if you notice, the department has vehicles with RMMS, meaning Road Maintenance Management System. It's an asset management system that the ministry has put in place to be able to assess our infrastructure, to assess the asset of infrastructure in the country. In that assessment of the infrastructure is the assessment of bridges, the assessment of the carriageway, the assessment of suspended roads, etc., etc. Now, we have introduced the system. It, we are collecting a lot of data. Periodically, those bridges are being assessed. The engineers would have to go in there with their instruments and to be able to assess the flexibility of the bridges and of, of the suspension of the bridges. Each bridge is designed differently. We have a piece of equipment, which is called a falling deflectometer, and that equipment we are now um, we more or less um, um, repairing it because it has some faults. So it, recently it was sent overseas to get it um, repaired. Otherwise, we'll have to invest in a new um, piece of equipment to be able to continue that aspect of measuring and determining and assessing our infrastructure. It is very important, your question. It is absolutely important because we cannot continue to react to the aftermath. We cannot continue to react when a bridge collapses, when a culvert collapses, when a landslide takes place. We are to preempt, preempt the activity. So even on the Bad Lil, when the Bad Lil collapsed a few years ago, if only we had that unit really functioning at its optimum, the department would have realized that there was some activity taking place on the road surface which is an indication that there's some level of earth movement happening. And the same thing with bridges. If, if, if you are able to assess the activity of that bridge, then you'd be able to say, listen, we have seen some signs of either undermining of the abutment walls, or we believe that the cross beams are corrod corroding and we need to repair them. So it's a very important matter, and it's one of the areas that we're placing some serious emphasis on. In fact, very soon, I'm likely to be traveling to the, the Republic of Thai, um, China, Taiwan. And one of the areas of focus that I've mentioned to them, because I believe such visits are supposed to be serious visits. It has to be of benefit to the country. One of the areas we are looking at is to be able to get the necessary technical support from the Republic of China, Taiwan, in as far as our materials laboratory is concerned. What does that mean? What it means is that the laboratory, um, the materials laboratory unit, which is that department which tests every bit of material used in construction in St. Lucia, to make sure that the quality is good, structurally sound, and can give a lifespan on the, on the infrastructure that we can be satisfied. So we'll, I'm looking at engaging the Taiwanese with their own materials laboratory um, unit to see what new technologies we can probably adopt and they can support us with in terms of making sure that when we construct in, um, infrastructure, structures generally, that the material use are adequate. Yes, and briefly on the road network, as we're touching on that, um, the Millennium Highway, what would be the update? Uh, did, they, did the hurricane affect it in any way? Has it delayed the work or are they, yeah. are they moving on? Are They'll they move on. on. There were no major um, interference with the work that they've done so far. Um, you know, it has been really 
one which has pained many of us, particularly myself, in terms of the work on that road. It has delayed beyond the, the expected date of delivery. We are seeing some signs of you know, advancement taking place uh, closer towards the uh, Fuhasho roundabout, etc., meaning that most of the difficult areas they've been able to address. And hopefully, uh, they had indicated that they would have delivered the road at the end of June. Well, that's yet another delivery date um, failed. Um, but I'm hoping that at least by August, September, that road will be completed. Um, once they are satisfied with the tests that are being done in terms of making sure that um, the, the, the strength and the resilience of the pavement, the new pavement that they put on, and that is just a regulated pavement, it's just a pavement to be able to give a time for settling of the road, okay, and to be able to detect any weak areas. Once that is done, then the final layer will come on and complete and complete the road with all of its other road furniture, etc. Um, the West Coast Road, of course, the contractor, the other contractor, has started. Um, they seem to be moving. They're now ready to at least tackle the Roseau Valley. That is the stretch of road. We do have some work to be done there in terms of relocation of some of the vendors into a new vendor's arcade along that road. Um, that is, um, once that gets going, then we'll move southward towards Sufre. Uh, and of course, work has already started from the cul-de-sac area, uh, um, cul-de-sac and Susi and, um, ne um, is it Marigo in those areas where we are putting, where they are putting up some retaining structures. Those retaining structures are necessary to, to um, be able to hold the road up. Um, so I just want to go back to the, um, well, the assessment of the, the passage of Hurricane Beryl. Yeah. Um, we saw a lot of complaints from the public about the shelters. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, people are concerned that some of these shelters are actually they're, they're not structurally you know, ready <coughs> to be a shelter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what can you tell us about the shelters? Because we know that the Ministry of Infrastructure is the yeah. one who, who gives it a pass. So. Mm -hmm. What's, what's happening with the shelters? First, let me indicate that the shelters were assessed. The function and mandate of the Ministry of Infrastructure to assess shelters is to determine whether they are structurally sound. That is the responsibility we have. Whether it is structurally sound. It is left to the department, um, the, to NEMO rather, to determine whether the facilities are adequate. Because if you're going to set up a hurricane shelter, it means the shelter is one thing. But the facilities within there, do you have facilities? Do you, are you equipped with sleeping facilities? Are you equipped with you know, um, hygiene facilities? Do you have bathrooms? Do you have toilets? Do you have kitchen facilities? And hence, it is important now, as you mentioned this, for government to review what we call shelters. Because shelters, in its raw sense, may just be a shelter and not a place of habitation. And therefore, we need to ask the question, what do we need in a shelter? In my own view, if persons are to run to a shelter, those individuals may not be equipped with all that is required to be able to house themselves comfortably. And therefore, there's probably a need for a redefinition of shelters, and also a need for a redesign and a redefinition of what we call human resource development centers, which should be able to act as what it is called an HRDC. And in most instances, the HRDC is really what before we call the community center. So even after the department has gone in and done its assessment and say, yes, it's a good location for um, a, a hurricane shelter, then you still have activities going on, whether it's dances or meetings, etc. So. It is one area I think we need to revisit and to redefine um, emergency shelters and to be able to equip those emergency shelters adequately. What are your thoughts on probably constructing, I don't know, I know it takes money, <laughs> so your thoughts on constructing actual dedicated hurricane shelters? But what, what for a country like ours where resources are scarce, um, I have always thought that what is required is a sort of multifunctional facility. 
So instead of a basic hall, and there's nothing else except maybe one or two rest, um, washrooms, we need to probably look at something a lot more um, agile, a lot more flexible. So you can have what I call a civic center. For years I've been talking about building civic centers. So in there you have a meeting hall where you can keep a conference, a community meeting, you can have an event, etc., etc. And then the balance of it, you can have other facilities which really would qualify that civic center as an emergency center. And in there, in that way, what you have, what you need to ensure is that one, the structural design of that um, facility is good enough to withstand Category 5 hurricanes, etc. To make sure that the location is one that is conducive, that the network of accessibility is one that allows people to move from one part of their community to the other to get to there. You know, a sort of hub and spoke kind of um, facility. So down the road, ideally, <laughs> You know, in, in some of the other countries in the first world, they have bunkers. So you get down there and you have everything down below. We, we don't do that here. So, but you have to have it in such a way that you have a hub and spoke situation where you have a civic center with an arm where you can refer to as your, your, your community center. And then you can have the other facilities that can provide a number of things which would allow for being able to sleep, for you. If the children are there, they can engage in real activity, human development activity, etc., etc. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Good. Thanks. I would have them some ginger ears. This morning, this morning, there is no coffee, only ginger ears. <laughs> Morning, morning, and gentlemen. The press. I, I hope that you, you and your families, were not unduly hampered by Hurricane Brett. I, I trust that you did, you, you did well. Um, I just want to first of all thank the people of Saint Lucia, the majority of them, for the understanding in that the, the, the compliance in terms of in terms of the the shutdown of the country it was to to, to a large extent the, the, the compliance of, of the people was noted. The business sector cooperated very, very well with us. Generally I think that the, the response in terms of people understanding the gravity of the threat was was understood. I want to say to the people of Saint Lucia that we're not out of the woods. This is just the beginning of of what is what the experts see is going to be a very intense hurricane season. This is just the beginning of it. So we must all the climate action that we must take, all the adapt that uh, the adaptation and the mitigation that we have to do as a people. We, we must do. There are some little things that we have to do. Um, I also want as a country to get together. This is not a time for, for us to play our politics. I mean, you can play whatever politics you want. If you get a Category 5 hurricane, there will be no politics to play. And I've made a point so many times before, there will be no politics to play. It's a time when the country must get together. It's a time when the country must understand that the, the, that situation is rather grave. I've been speaking to my colleagues in Grenada and St. Vincent, and in fact, it is heart-rendering to see what happened in these countries. And for us to believe that cannot happen here, it's almost, um, the, it can happen to us. We, we are in the, at the start of the hurricane season, we want to send out, understand there was some loss of life in these in this islands and express my deepest condolences to the families. I know the Prime Minister 
is very concerned about that, that situation. And the cabinet is meeting in a while. We're going to say formally how solutions can contribute to the, the, the problem, the disaster we need in St. Vincent. We've started some initial efforts to help the people of, of Grenada and St. Vincent. I have not made these efforts public, but we have done some things. Um, I believe it's my, it's my belief that when you, you assist people, most of the times, you must assist them. And the, the, the communications and the PR will, will come, but that's Lucia has done something to assist the people of Grenada. Um, as far as we're concerned, we are completing our, our assessments. You know, military culture will speak to you in a while. Yesterday, day before yesterday, in fact, I was in Sufre, and I was so I was very well received. And and I I want to make a point right now. Evil things, what evil does. I want to say it again. Evil things, what evil does. The people of Quinlas were devastated, the fishermen. If I had three million dollars now, I would have invested it in Quinlas to help the people. What I said to the minister, well, let us see if we can find $25,000, $30,000 to see if we can assist each of the fishermen so they can get their boats back. I make no apologies for that. And if the United Workers Party wants to think it's a bribe, that's what they deal with. I don't deal in bribery. I deal in assisting people. I make no apologies. I said it and I'll say it again. If I had $3 million today, I would have invested it in the people of Quenas to help them repair their houses, to help them to build their retaining structures, to help them repair their boats. If you, had on, if you saw the... The, the, the people there, the young people, the young boatmen, the elderly fishermen who had lost their livelihoods because their boat either sank or their engines were destroyed. If you had seen them in Quellas and on the waterfront, and if a political party that wants to get into power can't believe that a minister of finance is saying that he will assist these people and call it bribery. It shows you their mentality, it shows you what they think, and it shows you what they think about the people of St. Lucia. And I make no apologies. I'll say it again. If I had $3 million, I would have invested it in Quellas to assist the people of that area. And if I had $30 million, I would have invested it in the people who got their houses damaged. Because when your boat is damaged, the only way you can fix it is with money. How can you fix a damaged boat if it's not with money? But it just shows you the mentality. And I want the solutions to understand that level of desperation and that level of evil that's in the minds of these people. So I want to make it clear before you ask me any questions about that. I did say it. And the only reason I did not say it loud because I did not have, I did not know whether I had enough money the government had enough money to assist all the all, all people. That's why I didn't say it loud. It wasn't a secret. The government will try its best to assist them with money so that they can rebuild their lives, so that they can rebuild their boats. And here's what we're going to do. We ask the parliamentary rep to get a list of all the bona fide fishermen. We'll compare that list, the licensed fishermen, the licensed boatmen, and we will see the government resources, how we can help them with money to put their boats back on, 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 in the waters. So if the United States Party want to think it's bribery, that's their business. That's how they think. That's their mentality. Because they think the people of St. Lucia can be bought. I don't think so. I believe that the people of St. Lucia are sensible and if you saw the response in, in Sufre, if you saw how the people were happy to see us, you'll understand. I met the former parliamentary rep. I went to him. Because it's not a time for politics. And I invited him. 
and I will invite him, as all the other opposition members, to get involved in the recovery process. This pettiness and this idea where you have to burn the house to kill a rat, we must stop it. I'm the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, St. Lucia, not the Prime Minister of Labour. I'm the Prime Minister of St. Lucia. And I serve the people of St. Lucia until they decide they don't want me to serve them again. And I'll accept it. So this mentality of trying to take everything and, and, and convert it into evil, that's how they think. I don't think evil. I think for the people of St. Lucia. So I just thought I'd make it clear. Can I have your questions, please? Um, okay, I know you have spoken about climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, would you be able to share any specifics um, that, you know, St. Lucia, what is it that we're going to do? Okay, and I, I want to make an, an, another yeah. appeal today. I think the time for talking is over. We go to all these conferences and we get all these pledges mm -hmm. from more developed countries about helping and 1.5 and all these things. I think the scientific knowledge is clear that we are in a situation where there is need for climate action. I think we care about that. The time for talk is over. I think the developed countries must put their resources and their money where their mouth is. The scientists, it's clear, the scientists have made it clear. The disaster that happened in Grenada and in St. Vincent, that is that can only be solved by resources, money, nothing else. It can't be solved by goodwill again. It can be solved by resources and money. And if international countries help Grenada and the United Workers Party want to call it bribery, that's their business. I think there is, there is need now for us to have almost a Marshall Plan where when these things happen, there is instant support, both for adaptation and for mitigation. There is need for it. I believe that talk, we've got too much talk, all the conferences and all the talk must stop. The responsibility of the developed countries, who are the ones who the science has proven are the ones who are causing the emission that's causing the destruction, and we are paying for it in these islands. All our economic all the economic areas that we try, we, we, we've got ourselves battered. Now, our bananas, our, our sugar gain from Big Evil, our bananas, our financial services, now our CIP. What do we do as small islands? Do you know that with that destruction in Grenada and St. Vincent, the country has been pushed back. They've lost probably 100% of their GDP. What do they do? And we sit here and we only play petty politics with that? It's a call now that the Prime Minister Solution is making that the, these larger countries put some resources to support both the adaptation and the mitigation, in fact, some climate action to assist these countries with what is coming. That's just the beginning of the hurricane season. It's just, it is just the first B, and we go until Z. And it's time to first cut off this pettiness. Let's get together. I'm calling on the opposition to cut off this partisan nonsense and join us in that fight. Because when they continue, they will have, if there's a hurricane, there is no country to govern. There will be no country to govern. So let's cut off this foolishness and let's work together to deal, to come with one voice to these developed countries and these institutions. When we negotiated the Saudi loan, we put in a climate clause. There's need to be in all these agreements with these IFCs, there's got to be a measure of our vulnerability. Because if the GDP of Grenada and St. Vincent was X percent, it has actually reversed. So you cannot measure them by national income. 
There's got to be a vulnerability clause. There's got to be a disaster clause in these arrangements so that these islands can get some support. The time for talk is over. And we must start from within. And I'm calling on the opposition to stop this partisan foolishness and join the government to deal with these issues of climate change. Um, in terms of San Lucia's preparedness for, for this um, past <coughs> storm, um, and I guess looking ahead for the season, um, is there any lessons we, we can take from what has happened? I know there were some complaints, public complaints about the communication during the storm. There are calls for Radio St. Lucia, all of this and whatnot. Um, your assessment of, of St. Lucia's preparedness in, uh, and for this whole you see, thing. I'll tell you something. You can never be 100 prepared. You can never be 100 percent prepared. There's a lot of discussion after the fact. But you can never be 100 percent prepared. You have to, we have to try our best. And again, we need resources. You understand? We need resources to get ourselves. I must say, there are some gaps in the system that we are looking into. There are some gaps. I won't come here. You know, I always like to be frank and open with you. I'm not a showman. I like to tell you the facts, how they are. There are some gaps that we have to, we have to deal with. You could tell us some. We need, like, communication. I'm the only Prime Minister without a satellite phone. You see? <laughs> you understand? I mean, it's, it's, it's surprising, eh? What, what, what happens? You know, when I'm the only Prime Minister without a satellite phone, I don't have one. That, that's a simple communication. I can't speak to anybody because I don't have it. So we need to get that. Now, so someday you might see you might see somebody put on a, on a on a that the prime minister has a satellite phone. You might you might read that and see that. Yeah. <laughs> That's something that you have to expect in in, in the season that, that we're in. You understand? Simple things. Uh, an, 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 another simple thing is that we need to be able to have um you need me need, need be able to have a fleet. Ideally, we need a a, a helicopter service that's available almost immediately to move you because you can't. You need, no, you need that. Right? I want to be very. I'm very grateful to St. Lucia Helicopters who assisted us to get the Prime Minister of Grenada. I'm very grateful to them. They were good corporate citizens. You understand? I'm thankful to them. And m many members of the private sector are coming forward now. St. Lucia, um, St. Lucia sent in to Grenada. Almost immediately the day after, we sent in a, 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 some flour and sugar and rice to build a and the, and the private sector helped. In the government supplied, and the private sector gave the transportation. That was good. That 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 is very good. But as I to answer your question, we are reviewing now. There are some gaps that we must fill, but generally, I think Nemo responded generally but I also want to thank the volunteers the volunteers because there are people who are there who got no who got no salary no money no payment and they are out there the press the, the people at the NTN and GIS the press also also assisted and I must say I'm very happy with the press how the reporters really got together and were very positive in their in their stories and didn't get sidetracked. I want to thank you for that. Was there communication with the um, communication between, um, I guess, Nemo? Who's responsible for communication during this thing? Um, was there communication? Because I think there are reports that they, your address, it did not play on all the stations and whatnot. So there's confusion there as to. No, there, you know, there was, I guess, it's because yeah. of power. There were power power outages, this is why. But I must say, all the stations would have, us, would have at some point um, broadcast, I did a broadcast, but the communication, you know, as, as, as I said to you, we have to review, we have to improve. We have to review, we have to improve. There, is, there are some gaps that we have to fill. Communications is one, but again, the, the, the answer is, during that time, there, there normally is no power. So that, that's an issue. Like the internet went down because of power, power problems. So we have to meet everybody and discuss how we look, how we, we deal with. Because, you know, it's very early in the season, eh? <laughs> I mean, in June, 
heavy. This is normally happening in August and September. We June, it's very heavy season. But we're going to look at the gaps. But all in all, I think that we very we are grateful. We thankful to God, but we're grateful to the support we've got so far. Um, what about uh, preparation on an individual level? After after the passage, Lucilek made a call to property owners, reminding them that it is their responsibility per the law to trim their overhanging trees, and they really. Um, attributed their, their power shortages to a lot of trees being, being fall, falling. So what would you say to citizens in terms of their individualistic preparation, the trees, their, their roofs, their, the gutters at their houses, that, that sort of thing? You see, there is need for individual responsibility. You have to be responsible. And, this, and I've made that plea very often, long before the season, I've been saying to you, Tell the public of St. Lucia to have done for the garbage in the rivers. I've been saying this for a long time. These things probably go unnoticed and unreported. Done for your garbage. You understand? I've been saying to people all the time, clean at least a little front of, of, of their homes. I've been saying this all the time, you see. In terms of the cutting of trees, people must take responsibility for their own actions. If a tree is disturbing you, it's your tree. You should try to find a way to cut it. And again, that is a business of resources. <laughs> if the government had the resources, we would have gone around and cut all the trees that are creating problems for the people of for the people and for Lucille. That's resources again. It's not bribery, it's resources. But the resources, we have to measure them. But in terms of individual responsibility, people, I want to teach the people the idea of guttering. You may, you may believe at some point, you may know at some point, that there was a policy or there was a, a, a program, a project, where the government puts gutterings in individual houses. I don't know if you remember that. We did it, we started in some areas where there were landslides. That, because what happens to the guttering? The water gets concentrated to one area, and then you can collect it in the tank so you have water harvesting right away. We're looking at the possibility of doing that again. The possibility of doing that again. But again, it's resources. We're looking at the possibility of seeing if you can begin this guttering system and people can harvest water. Because as you said, power, no water. So if you have the, the guttering, then you can have people harvesting water at the same time. We're looking at that possibility. Again, on, on the question of individual responsibility, um, you got certain houses, and just from the eye test, you can see that they are poorly built. Um, and given like, any, st any storm that would pass, it would probably take them out. Um, the, the quest my question, though, is would there, do you believe that there should be additional, I don't know if it's legislation or maybe even government bricks to help encourage climate resilient building as well before the storm actually happens? Of course, with government bricks, no vat on building materials. That's a big government no, well, break. I know, I know that it's no, there, no, no. but additional. That's a big government break. So we ask people to buy galvanized, to get new galvanized, 12.5% cheaper. That's a big government break. I mean, you know, when these policies come, in, come to, into being, we must look at what's behind the, the, the policies. The policy of, of a break on bill materials was allow people to build more resilient houses. So you could check, you should remove a galvanized sheet and put another one 12.5% cheaper. But again, when government takes action, people believe that the action is punitive. Sometimes it's not. I mean, the, 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 the place people build houses on riverbanks, <laughs> you understand? I don't know if you recall, there was a time when the government um, was speaking about some legislation to avoid building a few, um, distance from a few feet from everywhere. And that went into a hole. No? Because, you know, we find ourselves in a situation where there's an opposition that wants to burn a house to kill a rat. I repeat that all the time. If the government would have come with any policy that would say that, 
You hear all kinds of things, victimization, uh, all kinds of things. But, you know, so I said to you, we ask people now, in the absence of legislation, to use their individual responsibility. We're trying to use it through moral suasion. Tell me, that's for yourself. Because according to Bob Marley, when the rain falls, it don't fall in one man's house, you know. The hurricane will not say you are UWP, you are labor. It won't say that, you know. It won't say you support Pierre or you support. It won't say that, you know. It will match up every house, including mine. And that's what we must understand. So it's an individual responsibility and not the time for political shots. Yes. Excuse me, Prime Minister. Do we have a, a cost for the damage? For, not yet. Has given, so do you have an estimate? No, or not estimate? yet. Can you give that is why what I saw in Quenas, I was saying to the parliamentary rep, if you can get $3,000 or so to assist these people, what I saw, you could give them $1,500 physically because they both each other. That's what I saw, only what I saw. That is why I didn't make it public, because we don't have a cost, we don't have an assessment, but to give them some immediate relief the people who were with me saw the problems that, 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 that were there. So uh, we said, well, if you get $30,000 to help these people immediately, and it would have been given to them, they would have had to have a listing, etc. This is what I saw immediately. But of course, the Ministry of Culture has done their value evaluation. And by the way, CAFA, I want to thank CAFA. CAFA were also involved in the assessment because you know the cemetery got waterlogged. Careful with it, and they've given us a report which I'm going to share with, with, with the cabinet this morning. Everybody has chipped in. Lucilek has sent in the, the, the report, but Nemo is collating all of them so Nemo can give a total report and it can be costed. But right now, I can't say what it costs. One of the biggest issues in St. Lucia is the issue of insurance. Sir. Do you think that time has come to have a general like an insurance, let's say for housing, housing and things like that? No, 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 no. Insurance is a private matter. And, if, and that's an issue. The cost of insurance premiums. And that's why we have the, the distress fund to assist people who can't be insured. Because you know, insurance is, is, is private business. And I want to alert solutions, insurance premiums are going to go up. Do you know there are some states in the US that insurance companies do not insure them? Because of the cost? You know? And these are the things as a people we have to deal with and stop this myopic small pettiness that happens in this country. There are some larger issues. The issue of insurance. The issue of reinsurance. The issue of insurance premiums. These are things we have to discuss. The Ministry of Agriculture, in the budget, I put in some money for insurance, crop insurance. Because we've lost, we're going to, we've lost, the minister will tell you, we've lost some of our banana crop. Our planting crop. The minister didn't cause it. I didn't cause the win. We have to deal with it. And that is why it's a bigger picture. You see, gentlemen and ladies of the press, that climate action is a big picture that we have to deal with as a country. It's a big picture. There's several aspects. The damage to, to school buildings. The schools are used as shelters. Fortunately, the schools are closed now. What happens if there's a disaster and the schools are shelters? Where do you put the, the, the children? It's a big picture. When, what about if your hospital gets, gets damaged? You need a field hospital. It's a big picture. It's a time when you must have a national plan to deal with disasters. Where everybody must get involved. So I'm very concerned with you making an announcement of the premiums of insurance going up. I'm not making an announcement. I'm saying, no, 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 no. Hold on. Do not reality. say I'm making an announcement. I'm saying, and don't, you know, because, you know, I get misquoted so many times before. Do not say the Prime Minister made an announcement. I never said an announcement. I said, the reality is that insurance premiums may go up, and they started to go up. I didn't make an announcement. I didn't say that. Please, because you know where, where that will go. I can't even offer a man a drink of ginger ale. <laughs> if I'd offer him rum, they would say I'm, I'm getting a man. <laughs> if I'd offer him rum, they say I'm trying to get a man intoxicated. I, give, I offer him a light drink, they, oh, but you know, I, but 
That's part of my job. Prime Minister, I came for you. Next time, I want to get a, a light drink today. Next man. time, I'll offer. <laughs> next time, I'll offer water. <laughs> yeah, just, yes, sir. Um, as you were talking about the, you know, the wider, the bigger picture, the wider context, um, the issue of land reform has been land reform, land reform, mm -hmm. um, land development. I know the, it dates back to some time the way people erect houses, like for instance in Fuashu and Slurry, You know, somebody. Would 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 this be a policy direction? I'm glad you said so. I'm glad you said so. In times to come, I'm very happy you said so. Because you're getting me to think about things, to say things that I think. So. Do you know? We announced a housing project for Rockall. You know, it's a subject of ridicule by the by the the UWP. That's ridicule. I'm fooling people. How can you put 64 units in Rockall? I mean, it's it's so sad. It is so sad. It's so sad. When we announced 64 units in Rockall, you understand? First of all, the United States Party does not believe that the people of Rockall need that kind of housing. They don't believe that. So they express it through me. I'm not the one who's going to, who's going to, go and live there either. These houses, was supposed to assist in the whole housing revolution in St. Lucia. It was 60, 64 units that people will be able to make a transition from into better housing. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. The land reform policies that we have we, we are putting through proud. The number of people who have got land with infrastructure to build houses. That again is to assist people to, to do to get where you get in, to get better housing, more resilient housing. I have told you about the 5,000 houses built in Dominica. These houses are ought to be climate resilient. Because we have to begin to build for the future. And climate action means resilient housing. It means more resilient walls. It means energy going into less fossil fuels. It's a whole climate action, which we have to take step by step, and which we are calling on the international community to assist us. So, um, in terms of the, the the restructuring of you know of the housing, would would now the contractors, um, um, architects, engineers, would they? be at that table, at that head table, in terms of restructuring that... that and it comes housing. to cost. Yeah. It comes to cost. All these things revolve around one thing, cost, money. All the action revolves around cost and around money. So when the Prime Minister uh, tries to assist people, he's not bribing them. He's asking, he's saying he'll assist them to improve their lives after disaster, after their livelihood has been compromised because of factors beyond their control and beyond the Prime Minister's control. The what the Prime Minister can control is to help with the resources to help them to rebuild their lives. And I make no bones about it. I'll do it again. Um, but on this um, resilient housing thing, uh, don't you think... Um, there needs to be a sort of cultural, cultural shift uh, because we see a lot of people, even if, even if the facts would say that the concrete roofing is more resilient and it's cheaper, we still have new, new homeowners going the traditional galvanized cost, route. Cost. So. Cost. Now, how, you know, it all revolves around cost they, because people believe that the concrete, concrete is more expensive, it comes back to cost. And if I had the resources, I would have assisted to help people to be, get more resilient housing. But cost is a factor. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, yes. as a finance minister, there is a troubling, burning issue that concerns St. Lucians right now. If the issue of banker St. Lucia who is on strike for the last three days, Prime Minister, is it time for the government to intervene no, no, in no. this issue? No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Bank of St. Lucia is a private institution. 
is a private institution. The Bank of St. Lucia is an institution that has its own laws, its own, its, its own board of directors, etc. We are hoping that good sense will prevail. If there's a labor, there's a labor issue, which the bank has to go for the formal channels, which is going to going for the Ministry of Labor, etc. We hope that good sense prevails. We hope so, guys. But you know, governments, the government believes that all sense, all sides show a sense of maturity because the people of the country are suffering. Not the majority shareholder. Many people don't know that. The government is not government in the, the seven majority. Or what, what percentage? And shareholders, you know, <laughs> you know, you ask us a very good question. Say, but you know, these questions border on the misinformation that, 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 that's been peddled around the country. Businesses are run by boards of directors and management. The shareholder, the shareholder doesn't get involved right away. The government is very concerned, but there's a process. What has been happening in St. Lucia is that there have been many, many processes that have been violated, and we think it's the, it is the, the, the law. Like when the prime minister says to the public that there are certain things he has no expertise on, I'm ridiculed. You want me to come and make engineering statements, talk about the size of doors and windows. I can't, I'm not, I will not. So processes. The Bank of St. Lucia is a private institution. It's not a statutory board. It has a management structure. It has management, it has board directors, and it has shareholders. These issues are dealt with by management first and the board directors secondly. I understand right now it's in the hands of the board of directors. I'm hoping that good sense prevails. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I am imploring the parties to let good sense prevail because the people of the country are inconvenient, some of them even suffering. But doesn't that <coughs> raise greater questions about banking security in St. Lucia in general? Because my, my, the reason why I say that, because it's Bank of St. Lucia now, but there have been other issues at other banks whether that be one bank deciding to go fully online, whether another bank having fishing issues, doesn't isn't there a, there a need for more government intervention in banking in general? No, you know, not just at Bank of Sydney. Government City. intervention in these things is resisted, okay. and that is why we need. You know, there was a there was a, there was a bank that said they wanted to go all online. Mm -hmm. I made a statement. I said, no, I don't think that's right. I mean, I don't know if you supported me. I don't know. <laughs> and, 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 and that's where, you know, that is a thing. that's the point, you know. There are certain issues that we have to get together on. I have my own concerns about um, this 100% non-cash city. I have my own concerns about it. I have my own my concerns. I believe people should have a right to go get their money from the bank when they put it there, in cash. There is a joke about a certain man in St. Lucia, a certain rich man in St. Lucia, he went to the bank every other month and says he wants to take all his money out for him to check it. Because he understands people, their bank is laying his money. <laughs> so, so he wanted to go out, he wanted to get every cent and check it. So he goes to the bank on the morning and says, give me all my money. And he checks it and puts it back. <laughs> okay, so you answered when you made a statement about mm. your concerns about the, um, well, the online system. Um, you said that you were hoping to speak with your regional counterparts about it. Have you? Jamaica has 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 made a statement. Um, I don't know if any of my other colleagues have, have made a statement, but Jamaica has has made a statement. But these things must come from private, from the private. You know, banking is very sensitive. There's something called correspondent banking, and this is why I warn you. When we're making these statements on the CIP almost encouraging. I warn you that the short-term political gain may not have been worth it. Yes, we may get short-term political gain, you know. 
Philip J. P. may not be prime minister again. That's short term. The long term repercussions of these statements are what you have to consider. And I warned you, and this is why you, some, some of you thought I wasn't strong enough and I wasn't do that, I wasn't do that. Because I understand the repercussions of these things. They are very sensitive. Correspondent banking is a very sensitive issue. Very sensitive. And I understand it because there are countries in the region where lost their correspondent banking and money had to be put in a helicopter and be brought to, to Miami to pay credit card bills. That's reality. And this is why you must be careful in our pronouncements. And this is why I'm still careful. I will continue to be careful on my pronouncements where the various things are concerned. Because I understand what happens when a prime minister says something that may cause some future harm. Correspondent banking is very, very important. And it's because you see, I'll tell you something. The banks have their own procedures. The, the, the financial architecture in the world, you, you must have heard about our financial services. Just doing well. Then they cut it off. They said about blacklisting. And, and we have to spend millions of dollars to avoid blacklisting for money laundering, all kinds of things. Anytime we are taking one step, they make us make two steps. And what we do locally, we fight against ourselves. As if we are a cause for it. As if somebody else would change. The, the last government had, a, had many problems when it came to the blacklist thing. I stood in parliament and, and I supported them because I knew, I understood the repercussions. Short term political gain doesn't help anybody because the reality is you have to deal with a world that's uncaring, a world that has no place for small island developing states, and a world that is more concerned about uh, their own interests and not the interests of 248 square mile islands. Yes. Thank you. One more question. Yes. Um, recently, I, I was watching the, the US presidential debate. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure, well, as far as I'm, I know, I have not seen such a thing in St. Lucia. The question is, would um, you, as a political leader, be open to such discourse give, before a, a, okay. a general election? I've heard that question before. <laughs> we have debates all the time in Parliament. No, but you, I mean, that's it. You never see, you will not see Trump and Biden in Parliament. The people put us in Parliament. And, you know, that's what, you know, the people put us in Parliament. The people didn't put us to debate, you know. They put us in Parliament. We have to deal with the issues of the country in Parliament. Because that's where we can state the facts, and that's where we have immunity. So my debate for now is in Parliament. You need to stand up on your feet in the Parliament and defend your cause. You ask questions because you recorded. The idea of debates, I have, I'm, I'm not, I have no aversion to, to, to debates, but I'm saying to you, what's important now? Let's just shift the goalpost. Parliament. That's what's important now. Stand, stand up in the Parliament and debate your cause. Were you on the record? The people didn't, didn't put us to go on the radio, you know. They didn't put us to go on social media, you know. They, they, they didn't put us to write on Facebook. They put us in the Parliament of St. Lucia. That's where they put us. That's what our system says. We're in Parliament. So we don't run from Parliament and go on Facebook or run from Parliament and go on the radio. No, no. We stay in Parliament. So for now, my debate is in Parliament. Thank you very much. Stay safe and thanks for, for what you do.